Welcome everyone. Welcome to this How Design Cast on Creative Cloud for Designers. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design Evangelist for Adobe, and it's my pleasure to walk you through uh, some great new ideas and solutions that we have for designers and uh, give you an update on what's been going on with Creative Cloud. So uh, as we said earlier, you'll get a link to the recording for this. And um, if there's anything that I don't get a chance to talk to or show, which there will be lots of things I won't get a chance to show, uh, feel free to uh, check out any of the videos that I and the rest of my team have recorded uh, either on my YouTube channel or Adobe TV, which there are links for that on the bottom left hand corner of your screen. And again, if you miss any of this, just head over to terrywhite.com and there are links for everything at the top of my uh, website. Okay, so let's head out of the slide here and let's talk a little bit about Creative Cloud. So I'm going to uh, just switch over to my browser. And in my browser, I have logged into creative.adobe.com. Once you sign up for Creative Cloud, this will be your launch pad for lots of things uh, Creative Cloud related. So uh, the first thing you'll notice is that I'm in the files area of Creative Cloud. And if I um, click on a particular file, I can see it in more detail. But as you would expect, we're seeing images. So we're seeing actual PSDs in this case and a couple of JPEGs. But we're also seeing file types that we normally don't see on the web. For example, if I click on this file, this is an actual Illustrator file. Now, all I simply did was take the .ai file, the gradient shoe AI file, and drop it into my Creative Cloud folder. And Creative Cloud took care of rendering this in the browser. So I didn't have to save it in some special format as I would with any other cloud solution. I just put the native file in there and I'm able to see it. Not only am I able to see it, but a couple of things have also been done for me. So first of all, um, without me having to do anything extra, Creative Cloud has generated this swatch file based on the colors in the Illustrator file. So if I just wanted to put a file in Creative Cloud, get the colors automatically generated for it, I can then download that swatch file and use it in products like Photoshop and Illustrator uh, and InDesign to continue my design work. So again, that's just an added bonus just for dropping the file in there, and it will do that for all file types. The other advantage is that I can share this file. We're going we're to get into sharing in a, just a moment here, but I do want to point out that Creative Cloud is constantly evolving. So uh, prior to a couple of weeks ago, there was just simply the share a link, but now I can actually post this to my Behance portfolio or work in progress for others to comment and check out the file that um, I'm working on in Behance. So that link just appeared automatically when it was set up in the cloud. And we're gonna get into a little file sharing in just a moment here. But let's go back to the files area and let's take a look at one more file. This is actually an InDesign file. And as soon as I hover over it, I'm actually able to page through the InDesign file, again, that was rendered uh, directly inside Creative Cloud. So didn't have to do anything extra, got the swatch file for it automatically, also got uh, typefaces that were used in this particular file. So pretty cool to be able to do that directly in Creative Cloud in a web browser without having to do anything extra to the files themselves. Now, if we head to the second tab, the uh, apps tab, this is your candy store. This is where you go to get and download any apps that are available to Creative Cloud members. So, um, of course, if you're a designer, you're probably used to having apps like Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. But if you're a designer that's traditionally worked with something like Design Standard, then you weren't used to having the web and video tools. Well, now as a Creative Cloud member, you can just go download whichever applications you want, fully functional, and use them whenever you want. So you can start with the ones you know, and then later add the ones you have always wanted to play with but didn't have time to or uh, the resources to invest in getting those tools. Speaking of time and resources, if we head over to the training tab, uh, this is, again, fairly new to Creative Cloud. As of uh, late last year, we turned on the exclusive training for Creative Cloud members. So in addition to this webinar, the videos on Adobe TV, the videos on my uh, uh, YouTube channel, so forth and so on, 
you actually get access to exclusive videos by various training partners that we've uh, aligned with that are only available to Creative Cloud members. Now, you will also see, of course, videos that necess aren't necessarily exclusive, but are put here for your convenience. For example, in developing a website, these are videos we felt that would help you along the way. And again, one-stop shop, you can get them all here. So no matter what you're doing, whether it's uh, graphic design, web design, video editing, photography, there will be vi training videos here for you as Creative Cloud members to access whenever you want and watch them. All right, so now that we've taken just a brief tour of the website for Creative Cloud, I do want to point out, um, if we go back to the Apps tab here, that you have the ability to download the Creative Cloud connection. The Creative Cloud connection is actually a piece of software for your desktop. And when you install that software on your Mac or Windows PC, you have the ability to just go up to your um, menu bar or task bar and go right to your Creative Cloud folder. This is a folder that's actually on your hard drive. And in my Creative Cloud folder, we'll see the same exact files we saw in the web browser. There's the Illustrator shoe, there's the InDesign document, uh, there's the PSD we saw in the upper left-hand corner. And I can drag files in and out of this folder that resides on my hard drive, and they will automatically be synced up to Creative Cloud. So even if I'm working offline, I still have access to all my files that I put in Creative Cloud. However, once they're synced online, I can easily share them, or go to one of my other computers that has Creative Cloud installed and work on those same files because they would have been synced down to those hard drives as well. If I'm working with the Touch apps, such as Photoshop Touch and um, Adobe Ideas, I'd also have access to files that I can edit and sync back to Creative Cloud so they're on my desktop when I get there. All right, so let's head over to, actually, let's head over to Photoshop and let's take a look at a few more new things. Now, uh, I'm not, I don't have time to, in this short 45, 50 minute segment, to go through all the new things that we introduced in, in Photoshop CS6. And of course, I've already done seminars and videos on those features. So what I'm going to concentrate on primarily for the rest, rest of my time here is the uh, new features that were added as part of your Creative Cloud membership. Now, keep in mind that as a Creative Cloud member, uh, you get the updates to our products sooner than the rest of the world. So people that buy perpetual licenses to Photoshop have to wait to the next major version of the software to get those features. But as a Creative Cloud member, you get them as soon as they're available. So for example, uh, in CS6, we introduced this new blur gallery set of fil uh, filters, field blur, iris blur, tilt shift blur. So everyone on CS6 got access to those filters. But as a Creative Cloud member, we uh, turned on a feature that allows Creative Cloud members to use those filters non-destructively. So for example, I would love to put an iris blur on this particular photo to focus in more on the model and the fashion design and less on the um, distracting uh, lights and, and foliage coming down uh, the wall. So prior to this update, if I ran that filter, it would be destructive. I'd have to make a duplicate of the layer, or make a copy of the file so that I would always be able to revert back. But now I'll just go into my uh, layer menu. We'll go to Smart Objects. We'll convert this to a Smart Object, which we could have done before. But one of the new features to Creative Cloud members is that these filters are now Smart Object aware. So if I go Iris Blur, I can then put an Iris Blur on this particular uh, image. I can adjust it. I can tilt it. I can do whatever I need to do. I can make it more blurry, less blurry, just by simply dialing it in, doing all of this on-screen editing, or I could use the sliders, of course, to be more precise. But once I get it looking the way I want, the difference is, as a Creative Cloud member, when I click OK, that is now a smart object or a smart filter. So I can easily not only just turn it on and off to see the before and after, or if I don't like it, get rid of it, but more importantly, if my client says too much, not enough, I can come right back to this Photoshop file, double click on that, and get right back to the same settings without having to start over again if I duplicated the layer in, in the beginning. 
So that's just one of the quick advantages as a Creative Cloud member back in December, you got this new feature. Now let's uh, continue on down the same path here. I've got uh, a video. Now, of course, video is not new inside Photoshop. In Photoshop CS6, we greatly enhance the video editing capabilities. So just to uh, show you a couple of quick examples here, uh, I'm going to switch over to the QuickTime player, and I'm not sure how well this will play over the webinar, but hopefully it'll play well for those of you watching the recording. But I'm just going to hit play on this video. Now, if you're not hearing the music, there is a music track behind it, and I'm not sure if that's broadcasting over the webinar or not. But the point is, you just saw a video, and hopefully you saw it perform well. But um, nonetheless, that video, that entire video, was created and done inside Photoshop. So why Photoshop for video? We have great tools like Premiere and After Effects and uh, you know, Audition for Sound. Well, we realize that video for our professional videographers, those are their products. Those are the ones they're going to use day in and day out. But there are tons of other people that have video around in and around their lives. For example, your smartphone can capture video. Your tablet can probably capture video. We have all these videos, but we really don't have the tools or the uh, skill set to edit them. But since most of you know how to use Photoshop, why not use Photoshop to edit your quick short video projects? So for example, I've got this video clip of this girl walking down the hill. And I like to do a couple of edits on it. First edit I like to do is I don't really need the part where she's, you know, walking behind the tree. It's really not that interesting. So what I'm going to do is just come over to the beginning of this clip and the tool automatically changes into a trim. It even starts to bring up a trim window as soon as I start pulling it in, letting me know exactly where the trim is going to take place. So I'm going to say that we're going to start it as she's emerging from the tree. So just that quickly, it not only did the trim, but it did a ripple delete, which kind of moved the video back to the starting point or the edited video back to the starting point. Great. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to do is go ahead and now convert this whole video into a smart object. So we don't treat it any differently than we do with our stills. So we'll go to our layer menu, smart object, convert to smart object. So now it's got the smart object icon on the layers. And now I can do any filters I want, any effects I want, and they will be applied to the entire video instead of just a single frame. So I can go in and I can do the same kind of thing. Let's go into our filter menu. We can use any one of our blurs. We can go to, for example, an iris blur. And this time, I'm going to keep it uh, oval facing this way so that we're keeping her in focus as she's walking through the center of our video. So again, we click OK, and that becomes a smart object on video. So as I scrub through this and go back to the beginning, she's constantly in focus keeping our eye and our attention on her as she's walking through the video while everything else is out of focus. Now, last but not least, let's add a couple other things. Let's go in to our transitions. Let's fade the video up and down. Now, this is a very short clip, so the fade is actually too long for this uh, clip to be as short as it is. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to add the one at the end just yet. You notice that it actually gave me the fade icon here on the actual clip and I can actually adjust the fade itself just by dragging. So I can click, there we go, and drag the fade to be a shorter fade. So everything's a very visual editing environment. So there we are, we've got the fade up from nothing to the point to where she's walking through the video, constantly in focus, everything else out of focus. And last but not least, right about the time the fade uh, ends, I'd like to go ahead and put the logo in place. So I just scrub my timeline back to that starting point right around there. We'll go to file, we'll choose place, and we'll go to our uh, folder where we've got our logo. And we'll go ahead and place that logo right where we want it to be. 
We'll go ahead and size that down and click OK. And now we've got our logo in place. And again, logo just added in as another uh, layer on top of the video and another layer in my layers panel. I could again drop a fade right on this. Here we'll just go to our transitions. We'll drop a fade right on the video. Again, we'll click on the fade and shorten the fade up for the uh, logo. And let's try it out. So we hit play. We have our video, we have our logo, and our video goes to the end. And we could just continue adding more video, more stills, more everything to add to editing our video. But the new feature, again, all of that is in CS6, but what's new is the non-destructive uh, blurs and liquify that we can apply to this. All right, let's take a look at one more thing in Photoshop before we head on to our next application. Uh, let's go in. Actually, I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to head over to, uh, let's see, let's head over to Bridge. Let's grab something from a folder here I need. And there we go. We'll open up this image. We'll do one more smart object. And let's go layer, smart objects zoom that up a little bit now we talked about the blurs being smart object aware but that's not the only thing that's smart object aware if we go to our filter menu we have one more that was never ever smart object aware always non-destructive and that is liquify liquify is used day in and day out by photo retouchers designers people that need to make slight changes to a photo but again it was always destructive so if we go to liquify and what we want to concentrate on, on here is we're going to zoom in to this little part of her sleeve that's poking out. That's what the fashion designer doesn't like about this particular photo. So we could go out and reshoot it and do everything all over again. Or we can just grab our warp, forward warp tool and we can just ever so slightly push that in to kind of line up. For our, for our fashion designer, saving them money, saving us time, not having to go out and reshoot this again. Okay, so we click OK. And again, before that would have been a very non, uh, would have been a very destructive uh, filter. And at this point, we can turn that off, turn it on, double click, right back to liquefy, get right back to where we were to continue to make more changes. So if I save it, close it, come back two weeks from now, I can still turn that effect on and off, saving myself time, space, and energy, because I don't have to duplicate all these layers anymore to be able to work non-destructively. All right, let's head over and do take a look at one more uh, new set of capabilities here as a part of a Creative Cloud. I'm in a mock-up of a website. Now, believe it or not, most web design actually starts off in Photoshop and Illustrator, because people like, you know, like yourselves, designers, go and mock up what the site should look like. In other words, you spend time working in layers, you work in Photoshop, you work in Illustrator, you create all your vectors, you get everything just right. And then you hand it off to a web developer who has to then go and take that photograph you just gave them and rebuild everything from scratch. We thought we could help you along the way by letting you continue your workflow, doing everything you normally do inside Photoshop, working with all your layers, all your layer sets, everything you do. But then instead of just handing over the PSD and saying, go rebuild this from scratch, we thought we could help you along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and launch. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple things. First of all, part of your Creative Cloud membership gives you access to the Edge tools. I'm going to launch one called Edge Code. Edge Code is in preview stage, meaning it's not a, a 1.0 product yet, but you have access to it. And in this particular one, I'm looking at uh, two things. I'm looking at the index.html file for this particular website, which if you're not a coder, don't worry. We're not going to spend a lot of time uh, doing anything to the code in this case. But uh, most websites are styled with cascading style sheets, or CSS for short. And the CSS for this particular website is empty. There is no CSS in this file yet. So if we head over to the uh, index page and we launch it in the browser, 
There we go. Let's go ahead and take a look. I believe I've got that already running. There we go. We see that it's just static, plain text with no styling because there's no CSS uh, code or in that CSS file to style this. And uh, this is it. I can't scroll down. There's nothing else here. So what I'd love to do is start styling this HTML or the CSS um, with the stuff from Photoshop. So let's go back to Photoshop for a sec. And in my Photoshop layers, I've got this cool gradient background. The gradient background is what's behind the site. It's going from green up to white. And I'd love to have the exact colors, the exact gradient, everything on my website as well. So instead of me having to figure all that out, I can right click on this. And now as a Creative Cloud member, I have a new command called copy CSS. That's new as of December. So copy CSS from that Photoshop background, head over to edge code, go to the CSS and paste it. And it just wrote all that CSS for me. Now I head back to the website, scroll down and there it is because Edge Code is dynamically updating my Chrome browser with any changes I make to the HTML or CSS. All right, now let's head back to Photoshop. Let's continue. So let's scroll back up. Let's select the gear text here, the gear layer, and copy the CSS from that. Head over to Edge Code, paste it in, and again, head over to the browser, and the browser now has the gear text. So it's styling all of this as I copy and paste from Photoshop into the CSS and Edge Code Preview is allowing me to see my changes live. All right, let's do one more. Let's head over to Photoshop and I've got a winter promo here. Now this is a layer set, so it's got lots of layers in it, lots of styles in it. I can select the entire layer set and copy CSS from it and then head back over to Edge Code Preview and paste all that CSS in, head over to the browser, and the browser has styled all of that text, the box, the background, the transparency, everything we see from Photoshop. So bridging the gap from design in Photoshop to CSS and HTML in your favorite CSS and HTML editor, which I hope is Dreamweaver. So there you are. If you are handing stuff off to a web developer now, you can now, as a Creative Cloud member, hand that stuff off in a better way. Okay, so let's head over to Adobe Illustrator. I'm in Illustrator now, and uh, of course, we've worked with multiple artboards in the past. So I've got multiple artboards set up here. Uh, in CS6, we uh, revamped Illustrator from the ground up. It's a brand new application, 64-bit, um, dark UI, just like Photoshop. And I'm going to go ahead and head down to the next artboard. And in this next artboard, I'm going to actually place a, an image. So let's go file place. Let's go ahead and grab uh, this leaf. And I want to zoom in on the leaf and show you that it is in fact something we don't usually do in Illustrator. We don't do a lot of pixel work in Illustrator. Illustrator we come to because we want to have vectors. We want resolution independent uh, vectors that we can scale to whatever size we need and still maintain quality. Now in the old days of Illustrator I might have traced this with the pen tool. As a matter of fact in the old days of Illustrator I would have had to have traced this with the pen tool. Uh, of course, Adobe has continued to build things into Illustrator to help you, like Auto Trace was the first. Then we had Live Trace, and then we have Live Fill, and then we had all these technologies. Well, when we re-engineered Illustrator from the ground up as a new application, we were able to also re-engineer a lot of the technologies around it, including a new, brand new, built from the ground up Image Trace. So when I go to Image Trace, I can have it trace this uh, using one of the presets. So for example, I can say, well, you know, let's trace it as a low fidelity photo. And because this is a brand new architecture, 64 bit, it does it very quickly and very, very, very accurately. So if we zoom in on this now, we can see that it is 
trace that as vectors. And if you look in this area here, it not only traced it as vectors, but it even figured out the color shading and where the tree or branches intersect with each other and how they would look as vectors. It would have taken me a long time to not only manually trace that, but then to go in back and trace and fill in all the colors and make them look like this. All right, so for the sake of time, we're gonna fill this in with our own colors. So we're gonna to go to Silhouettes. And now that I've gone to Silhouettes, we'll go ahead and expand this out and drill down on it. And then we'll switch over to our swatches. And in my swatch panel, I can now fill this with whatever color I want. Cool. Okay, so now that I've got this to be able to fill with whatever color I want, I'm gonna go ahead and scale it down a bit. Because it is vectors, I can scale it up or down, do whatever I wanna do with it. But I now wanna convert this into a pattern and use it to fill other objects. So I'll go to my, um, my object menu, we'll go to Pattern, we'll come down to Make, and that will turn on my new dynamic pattern generating interface. And from here, I can not only see the pattern it would make from that individual object, but I can then go in and start changing it. For example, I can do an Option or Alt drag to make a duplicate. I can rotate that duplicate. I can fill that duplicate with a different color. I can fill that different duplicate with gradients. I can lower the opacity of it. I can do whatever I want to do because it is live, up, live updating because of the 64-bit architecture. It's very, very fast. As a matter of fact, I used to say that you would never say the word fast in Illustrator in the same sentence, at least not for years. And now I can actually do that. Uh, it's matter of fact, it's saying, is that as fast as you can think? It's waiting on me to come up with new ideas and new ways of uh, designing this because it's just sitting there saying, I'm, I'm updating as fast as you can make a change. No progress bars, no waiting. The illustrator we've always wanted is now here. Okay, so now that we've got our pattern, again, that's a CS6 feature so that uh, everyone gets that feature. I can now just say that I'm done. We can head over to our object that we want to fill. And when I, the minute I said I was done, it added it to my Illustrator file as a swatch. So I can just simply fill that in. Okay, great. So that's all CS6. Great new stuff, image trace, pattern making. But now let's go ahead and save the file. And Creative Cloud members got an update to Illustrator a feature update that for the longest time users have asked me, can I package my Illustrator files, collect all the linked objects, all the fonts, everything that was a part of that file so I can easily hand it off to someone else. And package is now a part of Illustrator thanks to the Creative Cloud updates. So I can go to package, I can tell it where to package it, what folder to put it in, what to copy, what not to copy. I'll go ahead and tell it to do that. I get my Standard font warning, warning me that it's not legal to give away fonts. It's done. I can now say show the package, and it shows me the package on my desktop. Uh, here's the Illustrator file. Here's the text report. Here are all the link graphics that I probably forgot were in there. And more importantly, the fonts necessary to print that file. All packaged up, ready for me to hand off and, and share with my printer or whoever needs to work on this file. Okay, great. Illustrator, fantastic new features. Now let's head over to InDesign. In InDesign, um, we've spent a lot of time with digital publishing. Customers needing the ability to uh, create applications and publications that are digital. So I'm going to uh, launch my iPad here. And let's go ahead and see if this will give us what we need. And now that I've actually I've got my iPad mini today, and now that I've got my iPad mini here on the um, desktop, you'll notice in the bottom row, there are two icons at the end here, the Alice Ritter icon and the survival guide. These are actual applications built within design. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Alice Ritter. And it starts off with, looks like a video but it could be an animation. 
and then it goes to a static frame. And then from that point, I can navigate, I can swipe up, I can tap to play that particular video, I can read my text, I can interact with this any way that I need to, including the ability to rotate it vertically and navigate the same way. Great. All right, now how would you build some of this? Of course, we don't have time to build everything, but let's go ahead and take a look. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the sharing for a minute from my iPad. We're now back in InDesign. And in InDesign, uh, we introduced in CS6 the ability to have alternate layouts uh, in your document for your Digital Publishing Suite app. By the way, this feature is called Digital Publishing Suite Single Edition. And Creative Cloud members can create an unlimited number of Digital Publishing Suite Single Edition apps. So we call it DPS SE for short, and that's the way you'll hear me refer to it for the rest of the webinar. So DPS SE, I can create an unlimited number of these apps. Now think about that for a minute. Prior to Creative Cloud, to create a single DPS SE app was $395 for one app. Because of Creative Cloud and being a member, I can create an app a day. I can create an app every hour if I want. I can create as many apps as I want and never have to pay more than my Creative Cloud membership. Okay, so with that said, let's take a look at how some of this was built. Now, I've got the vertical version of that opening animation already set. I'm now going to go ahead and create the horizontal version. We'll grab our frame tool and we'll just uh, create a frame in the upper left-hand corner. I'm not even going to fill the page because it'll dynamically do that when I'm ready. Now... I, I called it an animation. It's actually an image sequence. And what does that mean? It looked like a video. Well, if you remember, the girl, you know, starts walking in front of the camera. She turns. She goes away. Then you saw a logo pop up. Yes, that looked like a video. And it started out as a video. But as you remember, in Photoshop, we have the ability to edit video. So not only do we have the ability to edit video, but we have the ability not only to export or render that video back out as video, which that's what we primarily do, but we also have the ability to render it out as a Photoshop image sequence. And we can use JPEG, we can use Ping, we can use whatever format we want for the individual images. And if you think about video, that's all video is, is a bunch of images playing back really fast. So why do it as a Photoshop image sequence as opposed to the video? Well, number one, I can edit the video, of course, in Photoshop, add my logos, add my uh, still frame at the end, and export it out. But more importantly, I get to choose whatever size I want, whatever dimensions I want for those frames. Whereas video might be okay for my horizontal or landscape layout, it would be much more difficult to make that video look right for the vertical layout. But in Photoshop, of course, I can make all the frames look exactly the way I want at 768 by 1024 or 1024 by 768 for the landscape and export out just the frames I need as an image sequence. So that solves two problems. Number one, I get to have my uh, image sequence be the exact frame size I need. Number two, it's probably going to render out uh, images that are smaller than a video would be. And in this case, I'd probably need two videos to really make it look right. So now that I've got those images exported out from Photoshop, I just simply go, to, go over to my Folio Overlays panel with that new frame selected. I go to Image Sequence and I load in those images. So we're gonna go to here, here, here and I've already done the vertical one so we'll just grab the horizontal one so these all, all of these JPEGs came from Photoshop from a video so we just say open and again it sized my frame automatically to be the exact size we need now I can say that I want that to auto play I want it to stop on the last frame and I don't want the user to have any interaction with it now if I plug in my iPad right now to my computer via USB and I launch the free Adobe Content Viewer, I can actually preview this 
from my Mac to my iPad dynamically. But if I want to preview it on my desktop, I can tap preview and use the built-in uh, preview tool or uh, content viewer that comes with DPSSE. And we'll wait for it to build that folio for us. It will launch the tool and then it will preview that animation. There's the logos coming up. Again, the sidebar, all of these elements added in Photoshop in the editing process, and then it stops in the still frame. So that is how that particular element was built inside of our app. Okay, so now let's uh, quit out of this. Let's head back. It's never unexpected when that app quits. <laughs> but anyway, let's go on and let's head over to uh, the second uh, part of this. Now, the second part of this is another InDesign document. We can go ahead, we can place our video in there that we want to play, but I'm going to scroll down. We're going to create an interactive element uh, on this particular spread. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, move it over, and I've got uh, this item, um, which is a group of different items, the text, the background, the images. I'm just going to select the whole item and cut it. So let's go up to edit and cut it into the clipboard. Now that it's been cut from the page, I'm going to go ahead and, and create another frame. And using this frame, I'm going to not paste, but instead paste into. So I'm going to take that group of items I just cut and paste them into this new frame. Because now that they're pasted into that new frame, I can hover over that new frame, hold down my mouse for a couple seconds, and reposition all of those elements into what I'm going to use as like a sliding drawer. So now that I've got that kind of in position where I want it to start, I take the entire frame, here we're going to scoot that down a bit, take the entire frame, head over to my folio overlays, and I tell it that that's going to be a scrollable frame. So I want the scroll direction to be vertical. I don't want any scroll bars to be visible. And I want the initial position to be what I've scrolled it down to. So use the document position. And so now, again, I can preview this either to my iPad, from the Mac to the iPad, plugged in with the USB cable, or I can preview it in the content viewer uh, that comes with DPSSE. So it will render out the folio. It will launch the content viewer. I'm going to scale it down a bit so we can see it. Yeah, we'll scale it down to there. And now if I did this correctly, I can pull this up, pull it back down. So that is a scrollable frame I just built using my mouse to control it, or if it were on my iPad, using my finger to pull it up and down. And that scrollable frame could contain buttons, links, videos, anything else you want the user to be able to do inside that content that they pull up. And uh, I always tease people, the first time you do one of these, you're going to pull it up and down about 30 times. 30 is the magic number just to make sure it works because you're so amazed you were able to do that without writing any code. Okay, so uh, my content viewer, by the way, always unexpectedly quits when I quit out of it. But anyway, so therefore it's not unexpected. Let's go ahead and now that we've built all this, I'm going to close the one we were just experimenting on because I've got a more finished one here. And at this point, we would now walk through the process of actually building the app. So we would go to our Folio Builder panel. And I'm going to switch back to the first document. And we would make a new folio. And we would call this new folio uh, Alice Ritter How for the How Design uh, cast. We'll tell it that it's going to be in both orientations, and we'll just click OK. That will create our empty folio. And now we just simply add our InDesign documents to it. So I've got two InDesign documents to add. It could be two, it could be 10, it could be 20, it could be 100, it could be how many ever, folio, how many ever articles you want in your folio. So I'm going to go ahead and say add the first InDesign document, and we're going to call this one opening. And it needs to save it first, so we'll let it do that. 
And now that the opening's been added, we'll just switch over to the second InDesign document, which is our feature, which again, we've added in all the elements we need for this. And we'll call this one Feature. And it's adding in all the pages in both orientations for that InDesign document, as well as dynamically getting it ready for the cloud. Okay, so now that, again, I would just keep adding more and more InDesign documents to build whatever, however big my app's going to be. Now that I'm done, I have the Alice Ritter How Folio ready to go. And at this point, I can select that folio and I can now use the new feature, Create App. This is brand new to Creative Cloud members so that when I choose Create App, it will launch the DPS App Builder and it will want me to sign in with my uh, Adobe ID, the same Adobe ID that I signed in or signed up for with Creative Cloud. So uh, there we are, it's taking me now through the app building process. So I would hit continue. I would name my app. Guys, we're building an app, we're not even, uh, we're not even coders. And at this point, it needs some elements to make the app show up on your device. So for, for example, remember when I showed it to you on the iPad, there was actually an icon to click on? Well, that icon had to come from somewhere. So you actually have to go build your icons and build your splash screens. Luckily, we walk you through the entire process. We tell you what size for everything you need. Now, I've already got this stuff already built, so you don't have to sit there watching me build a little bitty Photoshop files. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select all my icons and all my splash screens. Now, you mean I gotta go ahead and click on each one of these and load them all in? Well, that could be done, or you could just drag them all in and have it do it for you automatically. I love that feature. All right, so I built the ones for standard definition. Of course, iPads come in Retina Display as well, so I've got the ones built for Retina Display. And again, it will just automatically sort out the right ones and pull those in. And now let's go to Next. And this is the part where you do have to be a developer in order to build an app. You have to sign up for an iOS developer application with Apple, not Adobe, if you want to actually build an application to put on an iPad. And so once you go through that process, you will get provisioning files that you will build on Apple's portal and you will drop those in. Next, we're gonna say create app. And depending on your internet connection, which mine isn't the fastest today because I'm working uh, off-site, but it will allow me to upload that app and then it will build it in the cloud. So once it's built it in the cloud, again, I'm not sure if this will work or not on this connection, but it did. And I can now download that IPA file. That's what an iPad app extension is. Load it onto my iPad, just as we saw it earlier. Test it, make sure it all works, make sure it does what I need to do. Then once I'm done, I download the distribution file, and that's the one I go submit to Apple. Then my relationship become, becomes between me and Apple for that app. So I go through the normal app approval process, which could take anywhere from seven days to two weeks. Once my app is approved, it is on the App Store, ready for download and ready for sell if I wanna sell my app. So creating the ability to allow designers, yourselves, Creative Cloud members to self-publish. This could be your annual report. This could be your, in my case, a survival guide, my portfolio. I did a holiday gadget gift guide last fall for, I do that once a year anyway, and now I made it into an app. So you can continue building all of these apps having them available for people to download and or purchase from the App Store. And you can build as many of these as you want as a Creative Cloud member. All right, last but not least, let's head over to Adobe Muse. Adobe Muse is a new application as of last year. It came out last May. And it's one of Adobe's first applications that is available via subscription only. So that means that there was never a boxed copy of Muse. There was never a copy of Muse you would go buy separately. It was always part of a membership in Creative Cloud or standalone uh, subscription. 
So once you subscribe or once you join Creative Cloud, you get access to Muse. You download the application. All of the applications are downloaded. You're running them from your hard drive as you always did. And then uh, once you install that application, you can then begin to build websites. Now, I always start this presentation off with if you're a web developer, you're a web you know, coder slash designer, we've always had professional tools for you and we continue to build professional tools for you. We have Dreamweaver, we have the Edge tools, we have Flash, we have all these other tools designed for professionals. But there are people out there that aren't professional web developers that still need to build websites. And in some cases, they're either low budget or no budget, or they're a site that is going to be, you know, uh, high touch, meaning lots of maintenance, that most professionals may not even have the time to do. So, and if you're a designer, you probably are already designing sites. You're doing it like I showed before. You're using Photoshop and Illustrator, but then you're having to hand off everything to a coder to actually write the code. Adobe Muse is for designers, Dreamweaver for professional web developers. So two product lines for two different types of customers. If you've ever used Adobe InDesign, the tool we just left, then you already know how to use Muse. So let's start off with new site, starting off from scratch. And I always tease the uh, developers for Muse that, you know, you're starting them off asking them questions that they probably can't answer. If you're new to web design, you probably don't know what any of these things really are or what to set them to. Luckily, this is one of the first new Adobe applications where the defaults are really good. So just click OK. That's a joke I always make, by the way. And once you're in this uh, design or planning stage, I should say, uh, the planning stage is really, for those of you looking to, for something to relate this to, this is like the um, InDesign pages panel. So we've got the pages, master pages at the bottom, document pages at the top. So I can go into the master page, for example, and I could um, say that I want a logo on all my pages. So I would do place. I could go find that logo, same one we used earlier in Photoshop, place that on the page, scale it down. Don't even have to hold down a shift key because this is a more modern application place it and away I go. I can change the browser fill, which is the dark gray area to whatever color or image I want. I can change the page color. So in this case, for example, uh, I'd want it to be a different color and perhaps um, either no stroke or maybe even rounded corners via CSS that it's going to build for me. So I can do all of that in the background. Now, when I go back to my uh, plan stage, of course, it's done that to the home page. Now I need to add the actual uh, rest of the site pages. So we have home, we have about us, we have products, and of course, you've guessed it, services, contact us. And if you're thinking like most companies, you probably move the about us over here and you bury the contact us under here because you really don't want to be contacted. And that's a joke. Just kidding. Uh, and maybe you've decided to add in a videos page. So we've done all of this in our planning stage. It's used the same master. It's automatically populated everything. But the one big thing we're missing is navigation. So let's go back to our A master. Let's go to our widgets library. Let's grab a menu. We can just drag in a horizontal menu onto the page. It already knows about the rest of the pages, so it's automatically grabbed all the top level pages. We can say grab all pages to include the account us or about us. We can go ahead and design uh, the fill for this to be whatever we need it to be or transparent or different color or whatever we want. And we're doing all of this uh, without having to think about the code being written underneath because it's writing the code for us. And of course, we can even get into designing the fonts. Now, uh, the fonts will give us the uh, standard web 11 web safe fonts that we can use. We're going to talk more about fonts in just a moment. But now that I've done that, it's gone ahead and populated all the pages with menus and new in Muse. We had the ability to have multiple masters. That's not a new feature. But what is new in the last update 
as of the end of February, is the ability to take a master page and style another master page with it. So now that I've done that, master page B will have the logo and the menu, but I could say, you know what? We don't really need a page fill. We don't really need a stroke. And instead of a browser fill being a color, I'd love my browser fill to be an image. So we'll use the background image there. We'll say that we don't want it to tile and we want it to be placed in the center. So now master page B will be styled like that and I can use that master on any pages I want. Master page A has the actual menu on it and the logo which I can move around and it, or size or redesign and it will update not only all the pages that use that master but it will update master B which uses that same master A item. Okay, next let's get into the home page for example. We can choose file place. We can go grab an edge animation. This is using our new HTML5 uh, JavaScript enabled uh, animation tool. We can preview this page right in Muse using the WebKit engine. It will show us our animation starting to build there. Great. We can also preview this in our favorite browser of choice. So we can preview page in browser. It will render the HTML and show us the page in the browser showing us the same animation. All right, so now that we're back in Muse, let's go back to the website. Let's go back to the About Us page. And on the About Us page, we're gonna do a place. But we're going to place a file from Creative Cloud. We're gonna go ahead and grab uh, the boardwalk Im image. Now, the P it's a PSD. In Muse, you can place all the web formats you normally place, JPEG, PNG, GIF, um, Edge Animation, Swift files. But I'm placing a PSD, why would I do that? Well, when I place the PSD, it comes in as a composite of any layers that were there. And the only reason I would place a PSD is perhaps it's a work in progress or an image that constantly gets updated. The client hasn't approved this image yet, but I kind of want to get going with it on the website. Now the client, has, once they've seen a preview of the site, they've said, hey, we don't like this little hole here on the boardwalk. You know, that's distracting. It makes it look like she might fall into that. So I can right click on this, say edit original, head over to Photoshop, not quite sure if they're going to change their mind, so I'm going to duplicate the layer. Turn that layer off that I just duplicated and head back to the background layer. Now I've got my safety, just in case I can always turn that layer back on. And next we'll do a uh, quick selection of that whole area they want. We'll do a delete content aware fill, fill that in, deselect, save it, go back to Muse, and Muse is not updated yet. <laughs> Did I save it? Save it, go back to Muse. Oh no. Did I update the right one? Close it. That's a first. I've never had Muse not update. Yes. There we go. Okay. I don't know. For some reason, you know, if it doesn't work the first time, just do it again. So Muse is updated, and now that uh, has been filled in. If I ever need to get back to that uh, image with the hole in it, you know, for whatever reason, I can say edit original, turn on the layer with the hole, and save it, head back to Muse, and Muse will update with the hole. They say, no, you were right the first time, edit original, turn that layer back off, save it, head back to Muse, Muse updates. So that's why you would place a PSD. Okay, last but not least, I know we're going to save a few minutes for questions. Um, let's do one more thing before we publish or talk about publishing. Uh, videos. I have a videos page, but no videos. So there's two things I want to do. I want to say, first of all, let's add some text. So we'll grab our text frame here. Oops. There we go. And we're going to say, um, watch our videos. 
Now, by the way, as I'm typing, you might see the red underline. That's a new feature as of February. Uh, spell check is built into Muse now. But watch our videos, highlight the text, and instead of the 11 web safe fonts, I want to use not my fonts that are built in because these will result as images. Instead, I want to use web fonts. And when I say add web fonts, this will launch the Typekit integration in Muse, allowing you to pick from over 400 fonts that are served up by Adobe, no matter where you host your site, uh, that I can choose from. So for example, if I want Alex Brush, I can click on Alex Brush, click OK, head back to my font menu, and now Alex Brush is a choice. I can make that as large as I need it to be. And when I preview this page, um, which we'll do in just a moment, that will actually be live text that I can select, copy, and paste. And of course, I can make it whatever color I need it to be as well. Okay, next. Now, let's talk about the video that we don't have. Let's go to our desktop. And one of the problems is videos you know, aren't natively supported in Muse at this time. But my video is actually hosted on YouTube. So I just go to YouTube, grab the embed code, and we go to object, insert, HTML, and paste, and click OK. And that will go out to YouTube, find the video, and drop it in. We can still move it around. We can still see the place that it's going to occupy. Put this and design it wherever we want it to be. And now when we preview this page, we will have two things. We will have our selectable text and we'll have our video that you saw earlier that was done in Photoshop. Okay, last but not least, let's go ahead and talk about publishing. I have three options. With your Creative Cloud membership, you have the ability to publish uh, up to five websites, five different sites with Adobe. Uh, number two, you can publish or host it wherever you normally host your site. So as long as you have the FTP information, you can upload your site directly from Muse via FTP. And you have the ability to export out as HTML, which will put all the images, CSS, JavaScript, HTML5, everything in a folder, that you can then hand off to someone else to do more with. So you have three options for getting everything out of Muse to the web. All right, and I left off one thing and we can go ahead and open it up for questions while I get this one thing ready, but let's go ahead and open up recent, finished. Here's a finished version of the site. And one of the things that's new inside of Muse, fairly new, is the ability not only to have a desktop version, but you can have a tablet layout and a phone layout as well, which this particular one has. So if I go to the phone layout, I get to design a phone friendly layout for my Muse site or a tablet friendly layout and preview that directly in Muse using the most popular smartphones to preview it on. So iPhone 4 and 5, Samsung Galaxy S3, Nokia Lumia, basically just to preview the various screen sizes that are out there to make sure your layout looks the way you want it to look. Questions? All right, that's two kind of slightly different questions. So uh, we don't talk about future versions until we're ready to announce future versions. So I can't really comment one way or the other there. Um, Creative Cloud conti will continue to offer offline capabilities to answer the second part of that. So in other words, I don't imagine a C, uh, a, whatever you call it, a CS version of Photoshop, let's call it CS8, for example, that only works in the cloud. In other words, it would always be able to work offline. I don't imagine we will get to a point in the near future to where it's internet only. And keep in mind that all of these applications, even my, uh, these are all Creative Cloud applications, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, are installed on my hard drive. They're not running in the cloud. They have cloud capabilities, but they are still, even today, on my hard drive. And I imagine that will continue for the not too distant future. Okay, two questions. How clean is the code that Muse creates? With every update, the code gets more and more optimized. 
And we have a blog post on the Muse um, blog that talks about all the optimization, optimizations we've done to the code since version one, which we've done a ton. So things like, for example, when I did the rounded corners on that, um, on that page, and I said it was done with CSS. Prior to it being done with CSS, it was actually done as an image. So that wasn't optimized enough. So the team with the next update made that CSS instead of just an image. How do you get to the code? Muse does not expose the code to you. So therefore, because most designers don't want to edit or watch the code. If you're start, when you start talking about code and how do you get to it, you're probably not a Muse user, meaning that's not your target, Dreamweaver would be, but to answer your question, file export as HTML, we'll give you a folder of the whole site, go play with the code all you want. It is one site. So desktop, tablet, so if I say create a tablet layout right now, and I say just copy the structure from desktop, it's giving me a blank site. I now go design that tablet site to look any way I want. If I don't need, for example, the press page, I can then say delete that page off the tablet version because the tablet users don't need to see that. So it makes us think more appropriately about the audience that we're designing these pages for. So as you can see, the phone version is even more streamlined to just four pages. So you are designing all three the way you want them to be, copying and pasting whatever elements you want, making whatever pages you want, but it is one site. It is not three sites. All right, if you don't change or have your own domain, when you go to file and publish, it's actually being hosted through Adobe's Business Catalyst. So it will be what, I, and here, let me hide all this extra stuff. It will be whatever you call it. So let's say we call it How Design. And if I don't have a domain, this would be howdesign.businesscatalyst.com. So once I click OK, that and it will upload everything. And then I could say, take the site live. That will then use up one of my five slots. That will be the URL unless I point a new domain to it that becomes the domain for that site. It is five sites with your Creative Cloud membership via what I just showed with Business Catalyst. You can infinitely upload as many FTP uploads to other places as you want. Meaning with your membership, you get five hosted sites. Muse will let you create as many sites as you want. Uh, actually, the alternate text is added for you by default. I believe, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking something else. Yes, you can add alternate text. You can also get to the metadata and headings for each page if you want or each item. So the answer is yes and yes. Yes, it always has been and always will be. It is either available via a Creative Cloud membership or a standalone subscription to just Muse. So the first qu first answer will take care of the second one. <laughs> so it's iPad only uh, at this time. So the different sizes and orientations doesn't matter because you're building one for an iPad. If you were using our standard DPS, which is our professional or enterprise edition, then you would be designing different layouts for Android, iPhone, iPad, Kindle, so forth and so on. But DPSSE today is only iPad. Unfortunately, no, that is one of my feature requests as well. So for example, if I, um, here, let's use, let's go to the phone one, for example, because they're totally different layouts, I'm trying to even think if I have an example to show. Do I have one for VIP? Yeah, okay. So this VIP page, uh, that is the desktop version. If we go back to the site, oops, wrong site. Go back to the site. We go to phone. There's a phone version of that contact form as well with nice big phone buttons for your fingers and things like that. If I go to the desktop version and I change this to say, uh, if any of this is something I can change, let's say mailing list and I call it bug you list. That does not change the phone version. I'd have to also go to the phone version and change this to bug you list. So unfortunately, there's no, what I want is linked text and we don't have that yet. Uh, Muse is currently the only file formats for graphics it supports are ping, JPEG, um, GIF, and PSD. So no AI files today. That depends on where you're hosting. Your membership includes the five hosted sites. And if you host there, then once your membership's not being paid anymore, that site would then no longer function. If your site's being hosted via FTP, that's then it will stay there forever. 
until you decide you're no longer hosting with that provider anymore. So your site, in other words, we don't disable sites that aren't hosted with us because you stopped paying your membership. We don't disable functionality that you used and used to build that site. If you stopped your membership a year later and said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a member anymore. The sites you've hosted still function. The HTML is still there that you export it. Everything is still there. The only thing you would lose access to is any business catalyst sites and Muse itself. Okay, so Muse doesn't have any um, in any e-commerce built in per se. Like there's no, hey, add a shopping cart feature. But since it can import or insert HTML objects, uh, you can add that functionality just by going and grabbing the HTML code. So for example, this is one I like to show. Um, I do a, a, a just a sample here where I say basically what you're buying uh, here, let's do this. You're buying a personal visit oops, by Terry White. So I will come see you. And let's go ahead and make that larger. Oops, sorry. Keyboard. There we go. Make that larger. And uh, control that frame. And then we're going to go ahead and now insert the shopping cart button. So what I did was I just went and pay, copied the HTML from my PayPal button, click OK, and uh, there's my Add to Cart. So now if we preview this in the browser, that button works because it's the HTML that will add that to the shopping cart. And there we are. I didn't say it would be cheap. I just said you could come visit. All right, come visit you. Okay, so but there it is. That's how it works. So, in other words, if you have a shopping cart provider, whoever it is, if they can provide you the HTML for your add to cart, your uh, checkout, all of that, show cart, all of those buttons, just add them into whatever pages you want, and you would have your shopping cart experience. You always choose to save them locally, whether you're saving them to the cloud or not. So, for example, what I showed was we give you this folder called Creative Cloud Files folder. That's just a folder that will sync to the cloud. You can put files wherever you want. It's your hard drive. So if you don't put them in that folder, then they won't sync to the cloud, but they'll, it'll be as the way it always was. I can save them to my documents folder, to my pictures folder, to a project folder. You're, we don't take over your hard drive. It's just we give you this one special folder for syncing. If you don't put things in there, they won't sync. You can put them wherever you want. Well, you know, of course, that depends on your definition of very interactive. But if we head over to muse.adobe.com, there is this site of the day function that will show you kind of kind of all the cool things people are doing with Muse. And some of these are very intricate. And these are all sites designed with Muse. Not only do we test them first to make sure that they were, in fact, designed with Muse. If you submit your site and we approve it uh, for posting to this site, then we actually ask for a site file that people can download to actually play with. And actually, that's I'm sorry, that's in our widget gallery. So people are designing widgets with different menus and different kinds of cool things where you can actually download the site file to play with. But the site of the day, these are all actual Muse sites with very intricate designs, very intricate um, navigation, and just cool things done with Muse. So... Yes, to answer your question. Well, uh, embed's a tricky term. So what you can do, uh, for example, if I highlight this text, one of the new updated features of Muse is that, of course, I can put a hyperlink on that text, but uh, one of the other new features is now I can say link to file. And if I say link to file, and I go grab my uh, assets to place here, and I go grab a PDF, Whenever anyone clicks on that uh, link, they will actually get the PDF file, and that PDF file will be uploaded to wherever you're hosting. But as far as having the PDF display on the page, that's a different story. That does not happen automatically. So that's what I meant by it. It depends on what you mean by embed. We have heard loud and clear from our customers that they do not want automatic updates for various reasons one of which i'm in the middle of a project i do not want my software updating on me changing things until that project is over so we do not do automatic updates for that reason 
we will give you a notification. Matter of fact, many of you have probably seen the little Adobe icon that shows up on your menu bar from time to time, letting you know that there are updates available. So we take advantage of the Adobe Updater mechanism to let you know, hey, there's a new version of so-and-so um, to install if you want. Muse in particular, for example, since it was never really part of Creative Suite before, has its own update mechanism, and it checks each time you launch the application to let you know that there are updates. But again, even if there is an update, you can choose to install it when you're ready. Good question as part of the myths that are out there. So uh, there is no internet connection required to use the software. There's an internet connection required for two things. One, to actually download the software. So when I head back to my browser and I go to the um, apps page, I, of course I have to have an internet connection to even get to this page to download the software. Once the software is downloaded and installed, I don't have to be online anymore for 30 days at a time. Now, what I mean by that 30 days is once every 30 days, since it's a monthly membership, it has to do a phone home and has to do a check just to make sure your membership's paid for a few seconds. Then you can be offline for another 30 days. So you're not online to actually use the applications at any time, but your computer does have to check in at least once a month to make sure your membership is paid up. Um, think of it as cable. If I stop paying my cable bill, I can't watch cable TV anymore. So if I stop paying my, uh, my membership, I don't have access to the applications that were a part of that membership anymore. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of one month memberships and then people would stop forever. All right. So if you're going from 5.5 to Creative Cloud, that is a introductory price of $29.99 a month. And you would get all the applications you see today and forward. Um, if you stop your membership, then you, you were basically reverting back to 5.5. That's the last product you bought and owned. Everything else is a membership going forward. Ah, good. Thank you for the reminder. So I was going to do this. So let's go to files. And remember that boardwalk file that we did. So let's click on that file. I can't remember what, okay, I left it in the state of the floor being filled in. Now I can say share, share link, and I can make this file public. Allow comments if I want, allow the customer to or client to download if I want, or colleague. I can email out a link or I can say copy the link. Once that link has been sent to whoever I want to view this file, they will then not only be able to view this file in their browser, but they will also be able to add comments to it in their browser. They do not need to be Creative Cloud membership members. They do not need an Adobe ID. They do not need anything but an internet connection and a web browser to see your file. And if you've enabled download, they can actually download your file. The, you have to install the Creative Cloud Connection Preview in order for that to happen. Uh, very much like it is today. So first of all, that's a good question. Uh, you can install your Creative Cloud membership applications on two computers. Unlike Creative Suite, they actually don't have to be the same platform. So one could be a Mac, one could be a PC. They could be two Macs or two PCs. Um, if you decide that now you want to do a new computer and install on the new computer and disable your second computer, for example, then you would just do it the way you normally would with Creative Suite. So you would install the new applications on the new computer, deactivate them or uninstall them on the second computer. So not, that really doesn't change. We don't care what the two computers are. You can switch them every day if you want, but you will be it will be two at a time. Two at a time for one user, by the way. No. So good question. Can I uh, take the CSS and import it to Muse? Uh, Muse, although it has an insert HTML, does not have an insert CSS, unfortunately. It is available via Creative Cloud, and as it always was, Bridge was never downloaded separately. It was always installed with something else. So when you install Photoshop, for example, you will get bridge. There's my bridge right there that came as part of my Creative Cloud. Yes, there uh, are th yes, <laughs> there are really three forms of Creative Cloud here. Let me bring up a slide that will make it a little easier to see and understand. Uh, open recent, and there we go. And let's jump to this one. So there are uh, currently three memberships with Creative Cloud. There's Creative Cloud for individuals, which uh, has an introductory price of $29.99 for the first year, then the price after the first year. And by the way, that's if you're upgrading from CS3 on up. 
uh, after the first year, then it goes to $49.99. Uh, for teams, meaning something between an individual and an enterprise. A team could be five designers, a small design shop, uh, a person that wants to control it for a large family, however you want to define a team. Uh, you get more storage. You get 100 gigs instead of 20. You get centralized administration and billing instead of having to activate five different computers with five different credit cards or whatever. Uh, it's one centralized management, and that's $49.99 a month introductory for CS3 users and up. And once that year is up, then it goes up to 69. Then we have it for enterprises. And that is, you know, depending on the size of your enterprise, that is billed accordingly. So if it's if it's for your enterprise, you'd contact your Adobe rep. And uh, if you don't have an Adobe rep, we can make sure you get one. We answered that earlier, and the answer is no. You don't have to be ac 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 accessing the Internet all the time. It is a once-a-month check to make sure your membership is paid. Currently, Adobe Font Folio is not part of Creative Cloud but you will continue to see more Typekit integration. Nope, we have a student and teacher version. Um, actually, I think that offer may have just expired, but there is a student and teacher version for $29.99 a month. That is the regular price. Um, if you call customer service and say you're a student and teacher, they may be able to still give you the $19.99. I can't promise that. But that is uh, for student and teachers, $19.99 a month or $29.99 a month for everything we just saw. None of our applications in Creative Cloud do screen recording. We do have an application called Captivate that does it, but unfortunately it is not part of Creative Cloud at this time. That's a good question. Uh, I would actually, I don't know the current answer for that. I know that it was a year commitment, but it was still billed monthly. I know they were looking at an option to just let you go ahead and pay for the whole year up front because a lot of users wanted to do that. That's a contact customer service one on because I don't know what the current ruling is on it yet. Meaning, I don't know if they adopted the you can pay all at once or not. Fantastic. It was my pleasure, guys. I hope you got something out of this and you'll hopefully see me again at the next one.